I'm about to interview Neil Mohan, the CEO of YouTube. I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little bit nervous. Well, okay, I wanted to ask you about stealing. I feel like I'm rich. What is enough, money-wise? Ah, wow, that's an interesting question. Would you swap jobs with me for a day? I don't think I could do your job. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't that think is I such have... a nice way to say I couldn't do your job. When you were first announced, people were anticipating this. They were calling you, to some degrees, like an NFT guy. Why do, why do you think that happened, by the way? You can't, you can't speak on this, I know you can't speak on this. I can see it in your eyes, so we won't talk about it anymore. <laughs> can you give me your favorite product and then your least favorite product that you've made in YouTube? I don't think I'm gonna pick a favorite product. Okay, uh, okay, you're more willing to pick a least favorite product. I have your answer if you don't, by the way. If you could get a bionic arm, would you get it if it was more powerful and augmented your body? I, once upon a time, got a nice juicy fat contract from YouTube. Do you know how much it was for? I was paid for That is a, a very small vehicle. Uh, it's a K truck. Wow. It comes from Japan. It okay. actually drives on the opposite side of the road. Have uh, you driven this thing before? Don't worry about it, Neil. Just, right. We'll get in the car. We'll All just right. get going. We'll get, it'll be a great time. We'll it'll be a great time. Right. You can trust me. I have not been anything this small. Let's see if you can move this. It's a little intimate. Yeah, it's, yeah. it is a stick, I mean, so you should here. just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, that never happens to me. That's, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> just ignore that. Uh, no, we're good. We're good. <laughs> so, Neil, hello. Yes, it's great, great to see you. Great to me, see you. Yeah, I'm I really very happy you're you coming this. up. It's awesome. I've been trying Looking to get this going for a while. Yes, uh, and I apologize if there's been scheduling issues, but it's awesome to get a chance to talk with you. It's interesting because we share something in common. February 16th is your anniversary of becoming a CEO. That's right, yeah. And it's uh, my it's anniversary a year. of being a YouTuber. Oh, awesome. February 16th, 2018. Awesome. I got fired from my job at a vape company as the head of marketing. Right. I had $7,000 in my checkings account and I decided to become a full-time YouTuber and streamer. I love it. Anyway, it's been a year for you. So my question, how has it been? Well, I think as you know, Ludwig, I've I've been at YouTube for- Long time. Uh, for a long time. Like Google. almost Yeah, and Google even longer. Double Tech, click. Yes, you got, hey, you got it, yeah. I, like, we don't, everyone knows about the facts, you know, like the, the nerdy history of it. Sure. Colin and Samir can talk about that. But this past year is what I'm really curious about. Yeah. Because I feel like your life has changed a lot. Uh, well, I, what I was gonna say actually is that a lot of aspects of it haven't really changed that much. I'm focused on a lot of the same things that I was doing when I was, you know, the chief product officer here around building great products for, for uh, for people like you, but all of our viewers all over the world. And that still remains, honestly, a big part uh, of my job. Like when you walk the halls of YouTube, it's mostly a lot of us talking about what's like the next awesome thing we can build for our creators and also for our viewers. Like, And that aspect of the job has been the same. I would say what's been different is um, I used to spend a lot of time with creators. Now I feel like I do even more of that, which has been super fun and super interesting. And, you know, frankly, you most like of all- it? It's the most inspiring part of my job. And I'm not saying that because no. I'm sitting, I'm, to be honest with you, like that is where not just me, but I bet you a lot of the people you work with at YouTube get our inspiration from. Uh, I'm not a creative person the way that you are, but the work that you do is amazing. And we love to build the tools. I'm a technologist at heart. So I love to build all of those tools and capabilities that uh, allow you to do what you like to do. Well, okay, let me ask you a question because your life you said has mostly stayed the same. But some stuff has changed. Like you're a lot more well known, and I imagine there's a lot more media you have to do. Are you also, like, were you in that crazy Sam Altman group chat? Like, are you are you in there with all the yeah. CEOs, Silicon Valley? I was, like, what's happening? I was not in that group chat, and I guess if I was, I don't know if I'd be allowed to tell you because I feel <laughs> like I want to ask you about decisions. I have a theory. Okay, it is better to make a conventionally wrong decision confidently and have everybody steered towards that wrong decision and, and like working on it and believe in it than it is to necessarily have a wishy-washy right decision. Do you think that theory is right or wrong? I'd say two things about that. I, I do agree with you that a faster decision, even if it's a decision that you have to correct, is better than no decision. So yeah. I do agree with that. But I also, and I imagine this is the case uh, in your job leading, you know, not just what you're doing on your channel, but the various businesses that you run, I feel like, um, you know, by the time a decision gets to me, it's oftentimes a trade-off between 
two very difficult choices. Otherwise, the decision would have been made somewhere else in my organization. Yeah, right or wrongs may be wrong. It's more like this path That's or the, this path. Yeah. And one could be marginally better, Correct. but it's better to make the snap decision to the marginally worse yeah. path. Within reason, of course, right? Like yeah. the, the more data, obviously, you have, the better. The more opinions that you have that are different than yours, the better. But I do agree that trying to make those decisions more quickly, being decisive about it, is ultimately better for the organization, better for all of our stakeholders, better for the product. You are a product guy. You've made a lot of products. Can you give me your favorite product and then your least favorite product that you've made in YouTube? Oh my goodness. Now you're asking me to like pick a... Pick one of your children. Yes, it's gonna come back to me when uh, my teams watch this video. So I don't think I'm actually, I don't think I'm gonna pick a favorite product. Okay, Uh, because you're more willing to pick a least favorite product. Well, let me think if I'm able to pick a least favorite product. Uh, I have your answer if you don't, by the way. Well, give me me what you think should be my least favorite product. You gotta go first. (laughs) I can't tell you. I know I have definitely made lots of wrong choices in terms of our products or features or what have you. We have shut down products uh, Uh uh, that haven't worked. But I, you know what? I want you to start. Tell I'll me, break the ice for you, Neil, because I, I sense a hesitation here. Yeah, what do you I think, you? look, there's two that come to mind. Yeah. The first one, which everyone who's watching this is going to say, is the removal of dislikes. However, I don't consider that a product. And ultimately, I have an extension that fixes it anyway. So I don't care about that. Here's what I care about. Okay. Stories. That product, I feel like was not was not it. Was not it. But I understand why it was created, because everybody was making stories. Did you try it a lot? <laughs> not once, not. Okay. No, one time, one time. I did you it one time. I did it one time. I did do it once. So you do have firsthand experience. I do have firsthand experience. And, and that's what I mean. Like when we learn that, you know, something isn't working on our platform, uh, we'll adjust. It didn't solve a a, 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 a a real use case on YouTube. Yeah. And so that is something that we learned, frankly, over time. Two things became clear. One is that format wasn't really about short form video. It turned out YouTube Shorts was really about short form video. Yeah. And uh, the other thing is that um, that product that actually a- allowed for lots of engagement between creators and your fans and your audience in between your videos actually turned out to be posts. Yeah, and, and, I like posts. And so as a result of that, it sort of like eliminated the need for that type of a format or product because we already had things that catered to those use cases that our creators cared about. Sometimes it's better to actually make a decision, put something out there, try it out, learn, iterate, and if it doesn't work, course correct. It's okay that stories didn't work because it left us with shorts and community posts that do work. Yeah, that do work for what ultimately ended up being what we learned through the behavior of creators like yourself, what creators really cared about, and actually what their fans engage with. Let's talk about products that I guess weren't made. Because I talked to your predecessor, Susan. Yes, Did she saw her the other day. She, did she talk about me? Uh, <laughs> did she bring me up? I'm hoping you can open up the dash right there and pull out something I have for you. Uh-oh, let's see. This thing here? Yep, right there. Now, Neil, do you know what that is? I think it's the goose ass. <laughs> that, is, that is a genuine goose ass. It is correct, Neil. That is an right. NFT that I bet Susan she would have to buy from me for $1,000 if YouTube made a bad decision or a bad product in the NFT crypto space. Now, it's been about two years since that interview. Yeah. You guys haven't really made a product in that space. Uh, I'm gonna even expand on this a little further. When you were first announced, people were anticipating this. They were calling you, to some degrees, like an NFT guy. Why do, why do you think that happened, by the way? Uh, I noticed that. I think it's because you are a self-described technologist and you'll adopt any technology that you think aids people, all right? And we'll get to some of the technologies that, that you have already adopted, like AI. Okay. And I think you were maybe coming from a more analytical point of view on how crypto or NFTs could be used. Yeah. And people were thinking about it from how they were actually used, which was scamming people like Logan Paul did. But I'm curious what your views on NFTs and crypto are now, and do you resent ever being considered this NFT guy? I don't really resent one way or the other. At the end of the day, it's all going to come down to what we actually end up building on behalf of our creators or not. But on the first part of your question, no, we're not we're not doing anything uh, in terms of building products in that space. There was a lot of conversation around what the promise of that sort of technology could be for things like easier transactions, you know, federation of transactions and those types of things. And then ultimately it turned out that uh, there were a lot of other things that we sh- 
we ended up prioritizing to benefit our creators. And so the short answer to your question is no, we're not doing anything there. No NFT stuff. And so on that note, the goose ass you're holding, you can put it back in the dash. Maybe I, I should th- give it to Susan. <laughs> I have three more years on the bet. Oh, okay. If anything, my request to you is make a feature. Yeah. Make a horrible NFT feature or crypto feature so I can get $1,000. But seriously though, what is your opinion on it? Do you think that it was, uh, did you ultimately feel like there's some promise there or how did you think about it? I think the only real value was the use case that Susan gave to me, which was probably sold to her by somebody, which was, there was a lot of selling of YouTube channels and which is a kind of like a weird thing to do or YouTube videos as NFTs. And if you were to do that, getting YouTube involved in that process in a smart contract wouldn't be a bad thing. But I think from where crypto usually is being used or has been used as like a fundraising tool Mm -hmm. is a bad idea. And I prefer the path that's been explored, which is memberships Mm -hmm. and and ad revenue and ad sense. Yeah. And speaking of ways to make revenue, you know, I, once upon a time, got a nice juicy fat contract from YouTube like a sports star would. Do you know how much it was for? I was paid for Looking back on that, do you think that was a good idea or a bad idea? The logic was there's a lot of learning that we can do by working with creators, with talented people who are deeply invested in um, you know, a particular set of use cases, in this case, you know, what you were doing with streaming, yep. in terms of the types of features and capabilities that we should build on our platform that would allow for that genre of content to find a home and ultimately be successful on our platform. And so that was a, so the lens through which at least I was looking at it was through the lens of an investment in that type of learning ultimately. So just to be very, just to be very transparent with you. It was making a short-term investment into a group of creators to long-term help the platform for all creators. Well, I mean, the way I like to think about it is it was like a way to get those insights or bootstrap or accelerate those insights in a way that we could actually do the things that we do best, which is frankly to invest in creators like yourselves in the long-term in a way that is our strength, which is building by products and capabilities, monetization tools, et cetera. But I would say that we've built a lot of things there that we learned through that experience that uh, we might have gotten to, but it might have taken us a lot longer to have gotten to. And so- Wait, I helped? When you come to our product reviews, your name will be invoked around a lot of features, particularly around streaming features. Uh, And it doesn't mean that we're always gonna be able to pull those off, but uh, we have done a lot of those things that are based on that feedback and insights, and also just how we found um, people would use our products. Your last exclusive signing was Phase Swag, September 2022, excluding some re-signs. Now, how you currently see live streaming on YouTube, do you see a need to to do these investments? Or do you think the platform is at a point where it is sustainable without those outside investments? I don't think that, um, you know, the program as was originally conceived is as relevant uh, today. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think that our focus, honestly, is like, really building out that feature set that allows live streamers to do what they love on our platform. And, um, you know, I hope you've seen a lot of that investment around it, whether it's moderation, whether it's discovery and monetization has been a big area of focus for us. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's lots more to be done there. The work I think is never going to be done, but like, that's what we've been doing. I would say okay. it is getting better at the speed. I'm going to lock that in. What would say it's getting better? Well, it's getting better at the speed that this car goes. <laughs> you know, okay. which is, it's moving. We're going forward. We are going to get to the coffee place eventually. Okay. However, you've been moving really fast in another area, specifically shorts. And that is like a, you got like a supercar. You got like a Ferrari or something. It's definitely an area we've been investing very heavily in, for sure. When TikTok started popping off and YouTube did not have shorts, were there alarm bells ringing in your head? I mean, honestly, I, I don't, I don't really panic around a lot of different things. I mean, I think we are in um, the business of our creators video uh, for the long run. I would say that the outside aspects that affect us and really feed into our roadmap are honestly what creators like yourselves and creators writ large tell us and what our, uh, you know, 2 billion viewers tell us through their, through their behavior There's on our- There's 2 billion people watch YouTube? 
We have two billion, two billion users on our platform. There was very clear this appetite for much shorter form video. Like I said, mobile first, vertically oriented, and um, having a product capability uh, was important there. And the other thing, obviously, that was really important about shorts was this sort of participatory nature of it, where um, you know creation and consumption sort of those lines blurred a little bit. And I mean, you'll recall like, that plus button in the app didn't used to be there years ago. So like this notion of like ready creation actually was a was a was a concept uh, that came out of it as well. And so that's that was really the driver behind um, the innovation there. But that doesn't mean that we're not investing in things like live and live streaming. Um, you know, I, I mentioned a handful of features. Like you said, there's lots more to be done there. I understand the desire to go even faster there. Um, some of the challenges of live are different than they are for VOD, whether it's short form VOD or traditional VOD. Uh, and so we have to, you know, we have to kind of make all of that work seamlessly in our platform. So that's that's some of what you see in terms of sometimes what you might perceive as us being maybe deliberating a little too long on a feature or something. Well, I've actually become, uh, 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 my third eye is awoken by Todd. Todd, part of S&D, yeah. I spoke to him, but he's made me realize that what ultimately matters is YouTube. And so, although like live streaming is a component of that, it is the middle child of the components, right? It is not like long form videos, which is like the root, the, the, you know, the, the proud son. It's not like the youngest child, which is growing the fastest and the strongest. And it is the, I think, least used by most users. And if you put too much effort into pushing it, it can hurt the other two children. So I think to a degree, I've become happy with that knowledge. And do you think it's fair to think of myself as a middle child with that in mind? Uh, it's me your analogy. I have a middle <laughs> child who I love dearly. Well, yeah, obviously not you, but you know like the middle child me, I, right? I know what you mean, yes, yes. Um, <laughs> of course you the, uh, uh, Again, it's driven by the feedback that we get from our creators who are oftentimes getting feedback from their fans and audience in the context of YouTube, in the in the set of resources that we have, we try to allocate them in a fashion that is sort of optimal for the, you know, creator ecosystem in aggregate. And um, that means that there's a certain amount of investment going into live, a certain amount going into shorts. One area where we've been working um, in a concerted fashion is monetization of live. Uh, and that is an area where there's still lots of I think in the long run, lots of upside, lots of potential, but we invented entire products and categories of products to help with live monetization. That's where like page shopping or super chat, super stickers, paid digital goods. Some of the channel membership features that we have came out of uh, the desire to actually make live a more compelling product for our creators. Some of the things that we have done on discovery, you know, speaking of Todd, for example, came out of the fact that like the way our discovery algorithms have to think about live is just inherently different than VOD. And yeah. so so we do we do have investments there uh, to really nurture that format. Well, I'm going to hold this because I do have a question yeah. on thievery. Well, I'll ask you inside. Okay, I wanted to ask you about stealing because something that happens with YouTubers is there's a lot of sharing and sometimes stealing of ideas, right? And I find it a bit flattering. Like I've had an idea before and then a creator took that idea and then they ran with it. I think it's cool. It means I feel like I did something right. Mm -hmm. You were talking about super chats. Some uh, live streaming companies have implemented similar things. Do you see that happen? Do you care about it when they take an idea or is it just part of the game? Because you're like, hey, I've taken stories, you know. How does that work? I really try not to focus on it. Uh, 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 I really try to go back to ultimately the feedback that we're getting directly from our creators and our and our viewers. And I know it sounds a little bit like a broken record on sure. it, but that is truly what happens in our product reviews. So okay. when we when we do when we do a feature, 
like the next set of conversations around it, like to take Super Chat as an example, is like, what worked about it? What hasn't been working about it? What do we do next? What are the things that we didn't anticipate about how our you know fans are using it? How do we incorporate that into kind of the next rev of the product? That's really the way the conversation always ends up going. And our, our job is like, as long as we continue to focus and innovate and pick the right, ultimately on balance, pick the right things to work on, uh, then we're gonna be fine. I have a total pivot. On Wikipedia, it says you are 50 to 51, like an ancient Roman emperor, because they don't have the information. How like, is that uh, Meaning possible? like they're missing my actual birth date. Yeah, they just, they have like a range, you know, like like they've uncovered your tomb and they're still wow. trying to count the, the circles in it. Wow, you're gonna break news here. What is your birthday? July 14th. You're a Cancer? I am, yes. I'm July 6th. Oh, wow. <laughs> Pleasure. <laughs> Would you swap jobs with me for a day? I don't think I could do your job. No, I don't. I don't. That think is I such have, a nice way to say I couldn't do your job. Uh, no, I don't think I have the talent to do your job. Like a streaming thing? Yeah. If you were to make content, what would it, would it be in sports? Yeah, probably. I feel like I feel like it's the one area where I could say some stuff that would be. I don't. I don't know if it'd be of substance. Sure. But I could say you stuff. Could speak about, on it. Yeah, I could speak on it. You're a big basketball fan. I am. Yeah. I like. I'm a like a general purpose sports fan. I like all kinds of sports, but yes, I do love basketball. Do you ever shoot around? A little bit. I have kind of a bad back, so I'm not I'm not great, but I have a son who loves basketball, so I shoot around with him. Okay. All right, I might have a challenge later. We'll talk to you in the car. Okay. Here. Do you shoot around? I shoot around, I play every week. Oh, wow. I just so, got into so it. So you're like legit. I was uh, an all-star bench player in soccer. Okay. For high school. All right, so you're an actual athlete. Well, a bench, athlete. bench captain, okay. I would argue. As I've gotten older, I've gotten more into it. Yeah, I'm more into basketball. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I watch nice. every Celtics highlights on YouTube. I think you are already pursuing this, and you probably can't say anything, but it would be sick if that was on YouTube TV. Those uh, highlight clips and the NBA games themselves. I mean, well, YouTube TV has NBA games through our partners. Sure, but like directly, you can't you can't speak on this. I know you can't speak on this. I can see it in your eyes. So we won't talk about it anymore. <laughs> Instead, we'll talk about shorts. All right, let's do it. Because I have a problem with shorts. It's grown a lot and I get a lot of views from shorts, but sometimes when I scroll through an hour of shorts, mm -hmm. I feel really bad. Oh, uh, now you're talking as just a as just a viewer. As, as a, a consumer. Yeah, as a consumer of the videos. And it's the only time where I'll conflate the term doom scrolling mm -hmm. with YouTube, a website that for the most part, I never feel bad being on. And I consume a lot of YouTube. I consume a lot of YouTube live. I consume a lot of YouTube long form, mm -hmm. but shorts, because it seems so pervasive now, and it's oftentimes at the top of my feed, I'll get sucked into it, and the only thing I will leave after a session of scrolling through videos is how much time has passed as opposed to what I watched. Do you watch different content in shorts than you do on the rest of YouTube, or does it tend to be the same thing, or? I think it's- Curious. It tends to fall under similar themes, okay. but it usually escapes those themes. So what will okay. always suck me in, because I watched recently, because I've been getting into basketball, I watch a lot of basketball highlights and it'll, it'll be like craziest basketball dunk. And I'm like, I gotta see this. And then I'll scroll and maybe it's another basketball, like top five crossovers to learn. And then four later, it's like just something totally unrelated. And maybe it'll bring me back to basketball, but, but it'll always try to generally show me other things. What I've noticed is that the goal has been grow shorts. Let's get bigger on shorts, not just for your, from your perspective, but also from creators. And so, Sometimes they use gimmicks, which make the quality of the shorts worse, but they do it to get more views. And I'll give an example here. Have you ever seen the gimmick where people cut off a short intentionally before the video would naturally end so that you did not expect the ending increasing the viewer duration? Mm -hmm. Have you seen this? I mean, I've seen, I, I know what you're talking that about. That general yeah, idea. Yeah. And I, so I see a lot of that and it, and it pisses, even loops kind of piss me off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, look, I think that the reason I asked that question is in terms of your own kind of experience in the feed is the fundamental nature of our recommendation algorithms, both on VOD and Shorts, uh, have the notion of finding content that might be interesting to you, that we think is interesting to you based on what you watch. That's kind of the basis of personalization. However, for a long time, and both uh, across all of YouTube, we have this notion of what we call satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And it's not short-term satisfaction, it's long-term satisfaction. And so what that means is um, 
We do try to measure via signals, via direct feedback that we get. You've probably seen those surveys run yeah. in our feeds. Um, this concept of like, it's not like the satisfaction of that you get like after you eat a bag of potato chips, but then afterwards, like you're like, why did I do that kind of thing? It's like over a long period of time, are you more satisfied by consuming this content on YouTube or not? And that applies universally uh, to YouTube. So that's one thing to keep in mind. I'm just giving you this, uh, like this kind of inside baseball on how our algorithm, how we think about our algorithms. So you know that there are these other aspects that we take into account as opposed to like, immediate engagement right then and there. And and that's been an evolution for us. I mean, it used to be that, um, you know, the, the notion of things like watch time, where did they come from? They came from the aspect of like, it shouldn't just be about clicking on the video, like when we were a desktop site, right? right. Like, and that moved, moved things away from like that immediate hook to long-term value of that video. Like you're actually watching it for some duration. We took that, we layered on the satisfaction concept onto it. Other aspects that layer onto a layer on top of the algorithm. You know, for example, when people are looking, you know, in the context of things like news or medical information, we'll raise up content that comes from authoritative sources. So our our responsibility objectives as you know a platform that has an impact on the world globally are other characteristics that go into our ranking algorithms. And those sometimes are, you know, those are sometimes they might be counter to like immediate uh, engagement. Uh, and so I just, I'm giving you all of this uh, as factors that you should know are a lot of the signals that go into our algorithm. And so what you ultimately see in the shorts feed and we're by no means perfect and there's always room for improvement is ultimately a combination of all of those things. And it is not oriented around how do I get you to just stay here, you know, immediately to drive up engagement right then and there. Because I imagine long term that'd be worse. True, but I also think, I agree with you, but I also think that, um, I just, I, I do think that there is this fundamental notion and hopefully you get this sense, you know, everybody you talk to at YouTube of living up to our responsibility as a global platform. That's a really big part. And I always say this, you know, whenever I lay out the priorities for YouTube and I used to do this in my product job too, those sets of priorities come off the top. Like that's where we, Whenever there's a trade-off, that's actually not a difficult trade-off for us. We will bias that. That is, turns out that in the long run, to your point, that's actually good for our business too. But uh, independent of that, that's the right thing to do. And we are going to prioritize that, whether it's shorts, whether it's VOD, live streams, et cetera. And that's, I think, held us in good stead. And we're gonna, we're gonna continue to make that literally the top of the top of the pyramid. You're a product guy, I have product idea. Okay. You're scrolling through shorts. And you know how sometimes it pops up and it's like, hey, you've been scrolling for a long time, you know, or something like that. When it pops up, it says, hey, you've been scrolling for an hour and 14 minutes. Do you feel good about the time you've spent scrolling? Huh? Because asking for any individual short is tough. You've probably scrolled through 400 at that point. So if you do that, maybe talk about the entire session, you get like a like the happy or sad face, like when you walk out of a fancy toilet. Mm -hmm. Good product we're, idea. I mean, we're always open to look at what that what that intervention looks like. Okay. Um, your point is like, ask the question. Yes. To make it a more active moment. Yes. You should think about that. Okay. Yeah. okay. You just think about you are. it. You are. Like, that's a. I got a few things up here. Yeah. Lay, send Great us the, send us the list. We love getting your list. Just give me your personal cell. I'll just send it to you. I will. <laughs> I will give you my personal. <laughs> cell. Text them to me. All right. We'll get out of here. We got to get you All back right. to the You're busy. Okay. Man. Thank you, everybody. Yo, that cappuccino's fire. Thank you. <laughs>
a good rule. And really all it means is like, if there's ways to think outside the box on a problem you're looking to solve, it might be beneficial to both parties. Like actually in good faith, try to make it a successful deal for both parties. And it's not always, you know, that's why, you know, not every negotiation or deal or arrangement works out. But I, I have found that if you try to approach it that way, um, oftentimes ideas pop up that otherwise wouldn't have been there at the beginning of those types of conversations. And so that's sort of, that's sort of a lens that I've always had. I feel like I'm rich. And I say this because I've been wondering this to myself. When is enough money wise? And I'm hoping you can answer this as a mentor, as a guy who's made a good amount of money. Is there a line where you're like, yeah, I'm good. Or is it something you don't think about and you just happen to earn money? Like where does money fit in your life? Ah, wow. That's an interesting question. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to be able to give you like a great answer on that. What I would say is, you know, I do think about sort of what is the motivation as to, you know, maybe where, why I come to work every day or like, what do I end up actually end up doing with my time? And by the way, you touched on this in your video in terms of, you know, why YouTubers retire. So I, you know, frankly, I think Wait, you, you watch it. Yeah, I watched it. I watched it. Like you were, you were super nuanced about it. And did I you thought, like it? Like, yeah, I thought. It, I think you kind of hit on a couple of points, and I think that point that you made about not just why somebody might quote unquote retire, mm -hmm. but how I think is it was an interesting and uh, and I thought that was really that was really interesting. So so just kind of riffing on that, um, for me, the motivation of coming to work has to be about like what am I actually doing with my time, like. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you mentioned money, but I would say another sort of scarce quantity or thing to think about is uh, your own time. Like we all ultimately have, you know, finite time in a day, in a week. Um, in a life? Yeah, and um, you know, in life, just, you know, not to get super deep about it, but uh, you might as well try to focus on something that's actually motivating for you. And if you look at sort of the way that I've at least thought about my career, even before I was at YouTube, you know, you mentioned Google and DoubleClick, a lot of it has been about um, combining two things for me. Um, I've asked me to get very personal here. Yeah, but, uh, I have, but, but you uh, don't have to, I appreciate you. No, no, I'm happy, uh, but, I, but it, it's really been about the fact that I, I do love technology. You said that I describe myself that way and I, I, I've always been that way since I was a kid. But the other thing that I've always loved is like, media and creative pursuits, not because I have that talent, but because I enjoy it. And when I was uh, working in advertising at DoubleClick and Google, a lot of it was about enabling that, right? Like what does advertising do? Just like it does on YouTube, it also does it across the internet. It enables the production of all this amazing content and ideas that we all consume and like to watch or read or listen to. That's like my motivation and that's inspiring to me. And so that thread has carried through through my career, including my time at YouTube, but also before my time at YouTube. And so when it comes to like spending my scarce resource of time or how I like to go about my day, that's a big part of it. Is it fair to say that your goal is using technology, you want to help enable creators, creative types, and create basically the best ecosystem for them to thrive? And if that is the goal, when do you get to end? I mean, in a, in a nutshell, that is that is a that is the goal. That's yeah. a big part of the goal. That is, you know, a much more eloquent way of putting what I was saying in terms of my motivation. And frankly, I think a lot of my colleagues and coworkers' uh, motivation at, at YouTube. Uh, and I think for YouTube, for where the product that we build and where we work, my my again to you to use a sports analogy, I think that we're st we're probably still in the first or second inning. Mm -hmm. First honestly, or second inning? Honestly speaking, like I really think that we're still in the early days what? of what the capabilities here can be. Think about where YouTube was when Me at the Zoo got uploaded, right? Like, yeah. And think about where it is today. That was 17 years ago, 18, you know, almost two decades ago. Right. And think about where YouTube will be two decades from now. Like it will be profoundly different. And I just, I just think that like we're more so on the early side of that journey than even halfway through or or certainly the later side of that journey. And that's like super, super exciting. We're sitting right now in the middle of what I think is kind of like the early phases 
of a pretty profound paradigm platform shift in terms of what we're seeing with AI, for example. The types of opportunities that that's going to enable for creativity, back to, your, back to this concept of creator ecosystem, like I don't think we've actually imagined all of them yet. Like you see all the things that you know you're starting to see pop up, but I think that like the real use cases, both on the creation side as well as on the consumption side, are yet to be invented. And so like that's going to be a huge accelerant. And I think the cool thing about you know getting to work at YouTube is we get to be at the center of that like profound shift in technology, AI in this example, but also human creativity. And so our reason for being is to actually harness that technology, not as a replacement for human creativity, but as a means to actually empower it. Like, I don't think it ever can. I'm a firm believer that it can't replace human creativity. I, I don't either. And I, I, I'm a, like, one thing I feel like I know for sure is that. And I, but I do think that it will lead to some incredible tools, like something that you could, uh, you might imagine as a creative person today that you know in your head is like, that's gonna be impossible to pull off. A year from now or two years from now, it may actually be in the realm of possible. And that's like the super exciting thing. And I feel like it's YouTube's job to deliver those tools and capabilities to you. So that's, that's sort of how I think about it. You thinking of things being in the first or second inning is a very motivating thing. Because I think as a creator, sometimes creators think they're over their peak or past like their prime and they think they're in the seventh or eighth inning and it's very hard to stay motivated if you're that late in the game but to think you're that early it makes a lot more sense why you're so gung-ho about doing what you do yeah and i think that i mean you you, you kind of touched on some of this in, in your video too like it's like it's like you know we're, we're talking about it in the context of like creators retiring or or quote unquote stopping being a YouTuber, right? And you know, your your point was a good one, which is like, it's not really like retirement in the classic sense of the term. It's like doing something different. Yeah. And it might be that like the definition of a YouTuber, in some sense, is slightly different or very different a few years from now. And that's super interesting and exciting too, because like the creative possibilities that might come out of it are very different. And so that's that's sort of how I. I I view these things. You've talked ad nauseum about AI because it is one of the biggest topics. Do you fear it at all? Like the singularity, like I feel like being in Silicon Valley, it would be very easy to immediately start fearing it or perhaps start loving it too much. Where do you put yourself on that spectrum? I think that uh, when I say that it is going to be a paradigm shift or a platform shift, and this is this is my view, obviously, seeing what the potential is, the capabilities are. Uh, we collaborate very closely at YouTube with Google DeepMind, for example. And so I, I get, I'm privileged to get to see the cutting edge of what's happening in this field. So I do think that it will be a very powerful set of tools and capabilities that we all will have as human beings. Um, but that's the lens through which I look at it. And, you know, I happen to look at it through the lens of, you know, what we just talked about, like, allowing people to be creative, allowing people to reach their full potential in the creative pursuits. And in that, through that lens, I really view it as um, a set of tools and capabilities that, will, that we need to develop and invent and emerge. We have this uh, experiment running, it's called Dream Track. The, the ones from the newsletter, the Dream Track, is that? Yeah, actually, yeah. did you, have you, so yeah, so. Yeah, like, I read your letters, okay. please, respectfully. <laughs> But I, I would it be correct to say you are bullish on AI augmentation more so than AI as a replacement? That is 100% the lens through which I see it. And it's the lens through which all the product teams and engineering uh, leaders and, and talent at YouTube really sees it. And it might be that like the actual tool or the amazing thing that comes out of it, we haven't invented yet. That's definitely the case. Um, but it, as long as we continue to look at through that sort of augmentation lens, I think that's, that's, that's YouTube strength. If you could get a bionic arm, would you get it if it was more powerful and augmented your body? You know, like, is it, is it reversible? No, definitely not reversible. Okay. I don't know if I would jump at that right away. Okay. You'd wait. Jumping, I might. Would you? Oh yeah, man. You would do it? You'd do it? Oh, I would be a, if I could shoot threes like Steph Curry, please. 
you've had a lot of success and YouTube has had a lot of big success and you've worked very hard for a lot of these successes. But I have to ask, how much do you factor luck to the success you and YouTube have had? I believe that luck uh, plays a role in, you know, all aspects of this. And like, you know, I'm using like luck in a general term, right? Like, yes, you know, you were, you know, you and I were born in specific eras, right? Like there was certain technology that existed that didn't exist before. You know, one of the biggest things I would say is like YouTube was this technology platform, this capability, this set of rules that allowed for things to happen. But YouTube would be nowhere if it wasn't for our creators. They're the heart of YouTube. So is that luck or is that like opportunity meets like preparedness, right? Like kind of a thing. So yeah, so those are, that's, that's, that's the lens through which I look at it. I sometimes, cause I find that I've been lucky based off like the general factors of life that I cannot control. The fact that I was born where I was born with enough money to buy like a blue Yeti microphone with the passion for YouTube in the era that I was in. I find it difficult to deal with a lot of success being placed in luck because it makes me feel a bit, a bit guilty. How do I feel better? Uh, I, don't, I think you got to talk to a lot of people to give you all kinds of opinions about that. I mean, I can... Uh, do you ever I, think about that? I mean, I, I do think about... Uh, I think about responsibility if, if that's it's sort of one way to think about it, which is I feel that um, YouTube... Uh, you know, where I spend a lot of my time, uh, does a lot of amazing things in the world in terms of giving opportunity, right? Like in the sense that um, when you decided to become a creator on our platform, nobody told you that, um, hey Ludwig, you don't, you don't like, you don't like look the right way or you don't sound the right way or like your idea is not a good idea or what have you. You could do it and you were able to connect with your audience and kind of, and accomplish that. And I think that that's like, I, I feel like as long as we're enabling those types of opportunities, um, then on balance, YouTube is 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 really a force for good in terms of, of, of delivering that in the world. And by the way, that I gave you a creator example that applies on the, on the uh, you know, viewer side as, uh, as well. Like we all have, our own personal experiences, myself included, many times over of an insight that we've gotten or something that we've learned uh, or something amazing that we saw on YouTube. Uh, and um, that's sort of how I think about kind of our place in the world, our responsibility. I'm driven by a sense of responsibility. It's actually like my main yeah. motivator yeah. is that I have a company off brand and it has 30 employees. Yeah. And I feel responsible to each and every one of them to make sure that they have like a livelihood and that they're, you know, not going to be out on the street or whatever, yeah. uh, which is a burden. And you have this burden with a much higher multiplier. Uh, so I guess my question is like, how do you deal with that? Is that why you just put your nose to the ground and, and grind? Like what? I mean, it's kind of, I mean, it's very similar to what you just said, which is you described it as, you know, like, kind of you, you described it as a burden but you also said it's kind of like what what you're driven by yeah. and that's how I think about it too and and when I when I'm describing this concept of responsibility at YouTube it's of course uh, to all of us all of my colleagues at YouTube but uh, all of our co all of my colleagues feel this responsibility in terms of the millions of creators on our platform the billions of users on our platform and I do think that's a motivator. Um, it certainly is for me, and when I speak with my colleagues, I feel like that's that's an it's, it's a it's a it's a responsibility, and to use your term, maybe a burden in that way, but it's a responsibility that's also a privilege, frankly. It is. Can I tell you my dream? Yeah. I've been a creator for six years. My motivation at first was daily uploading. Mm -hmm. Then it was being the biggest I could be as a streamer. Mm -hmm. I achieved both those to a degree. Now my motivation is making off-brand profitable okay. without the need for me as a creator fueling the enterprise. Like we, making the business profitable without the Ludwig brand. Is exactly, what yeah. Interesting. Because we service other creators as well as, okay. as myself. Yeah. Then I want to quit and fuck off to France or Japan and open up a bakery and make bread. 
I did hear about your bakery you did? Uh, vision. Why do you have to quit to do that, though? Well, I think it's how you exit. Mm -hmm. I see. Because I could half-ass YouTube and half-ass a bakery, mm -hmm. or I could exit on my terms my way mm -hmm. and just open up my bakery. Not to say I can't make a video a year of working as a baker or whatever. But what happens with your company? Back to your point around... Well, I have to make it profitable first. Okay. Without the need it, for me. And then it's on its own. And then, yes, I want it to be... The need for you as a brand, but it, it might have the need for you as a leader. But everything should be able to exist without me because everything has existed without me. In the same way that, you know. Same with YouTube. Exactly. Yeah. 100%. It can exist without, let's, without sure. Susan at helm and eventually it'll be able to exist without you at helm. 100%. But while you're here and while I'm here as a CEO, I want to do the best I can so it has the best chance. Yeah. That makes sense. Do you have a, uh, a time horizon on this or have you not thought about that aspect? I've thought about it. I think okay. I can do it in two and a half years. Wow. That's ambitious. Two and a half to five years. That's my wow. timeline. Wow. It's my motivation. It pushes me. Yeah. How do you inspire and motivate others to achieve something that's ambitious, like being pro profitable two and a half years or being the best at short form within two years? Like, how do you inspire others to, to, to get that done? Yeah. I mean, I think part of it is actually sort of what you just did, which is articulating a vision and kind of a path there as... I imagine that some version of what you said is what you share with your teams and the like, and I think that that's motivating and inspiring for people. I think that what motivates myself, but our colleagues, is not necessarily like, let's be like the biggest at this or, or what have you. It's really back to like, did we build a service or a product that just gets really, really great feedback and usage by our creators and viewers? So. You know, we talked a lot about shorts. We talked a lot about live um, uh, from a creator's perspective. But also, like, we, we love to hear that kind of feedback from our uh, viewers. Like, I love to hear when I'm either, you know, at dinner or even, like, just walking somewhere and somebody will say, oh, you know, because of you, I discovered XYZ creator. Like, that is, like, the gold and the motivator. Or... You know, I was watching the NFL on YouTube and I, I love your multi-view feature or what have you. Like, like that, like that's, that's the motivator Yeah. For, for me and I think it is for a lot of my colleagues. You just like making dope shit at its core. Yeah, and that's like the long term back to my like, that's why I think we're sort of still in the first or second inning of it. There's a whole long road of things um, that I think we're going to get to continue to build and deliver for, uh, for creators really all over the world. Like we're just getting started on it. Well, I have two final things because we're okay. just about at your office and you got some stuff to do. All right. The first one, I want you to give me a prediction on YouTube in five years. Is it mainly short centric? Is it long form centric? Is it a mixture as it is today? Has the mixture changed? Where do you see it? I, I, I see it as a mixture like it is today. The, the mix might change a little bit. Do you think it'll be more TV, even more TV? Yes. Do you think it'll keep going up? Yes. I mean, that is, as you know, I mentioned it in my letter. It's our fastest growing surface. We didn't talk much about it, but it's, in, it's something that I'm super, super excited about. Mm -hmm. uh, it's great for our creators. Uh, we have lots of creators who it's now their primary um, surface uh, in terms of where they're discovered and watched. Uh, and I think that there's just a lot of really interesting things we can do given that surface area, given the context the user's in, in their family room, on their couch, that is different than what you do on a mobile device. So mm -hmm. yes, I'm super fired up about it. Last thing. Yeah. Will you come to my bakery when it's open? I will 100% come to your bakery. <laughs> Lock it in. Lock it in, Neil. <laughs> well, hey, I appreciate it. Let's get out of here. I gotta awesome. get you back to work. Okay, thank you. That was fun. I do have a gift for you as well. I forgot about this. Oh my goodness, wow. Do you perhaps have a bidet at your house? Uh, I do not have a bidet at my house. Really? No, I don't. Well, uh, I made my own bidet. You're a product guy, so I'm hoping you'll take it back and and you know I can help you get someone to install it. But that is awesome. It's a it's a swipe plus oh, wow. bidet. Thank you. Oh wow! It's, it's got a heated seat, heated water. It's great for the tushy wow, and also awesome. for the soul. I uh, can't wait to check it out. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate awesome. you, Neil. I did not realize this is how, what I would leave with. So. I'm very excited. Thank Heck you. Yeah. We got something for you too. For me? Actually, yes. You spoke about uh, okay. the dream of a bakery. Yes, I have. I think these are a couple of things that are going to get you started. Okay. So, yeah. Should I open them now? He's out to open. Let's check it out. All right, which one do I open first? Is this going to help with my bakery? It will. <laughs>
Is it okay? You can YouTube remember overalls. all of us when we're uh, YouTube aprons. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got your name on you it there. Wait, it has my name on it? Yeah. Look at that. <laughs> and one for cutie too. <laughs> Look at that. Okay. And then what's this bad boy? Oh, YouTube awesome rolling pen. That? That was pretty. Okay, maybe Something I have to Something to remember us by. I gotta start baking bread now. Yeah. Well, thank you very yeah, much. I awesome. appreciate yeah, it, Neil. Yeah. Absolute thank pleasure. Thank you for making the time. It's awesome. Me Great making to have the, the time. conversation. Oh, Buddy, it's you're Thursday. Busy. You're Usually, busy guy. I smoke weed and play Valorant on Thursdays. <laughs> <laughs>